see if we can get me. Thank you so much. That was our first Susan of the day. We have three. <laughs> so next up, I'm going to introduce Susan Headland, our only local on the agenda here from Oregon Health and Science University. And so come on up, Susan. I'm not going to go through the whole bios of everyone who comes up onto the stage. They're all in your program. So please read them. We have some awesome uh, people, experts here today. Uh, so check them out. I'll let Susan take over. The Susan trifecta here. I think we uh, must be from the same generation. I don't see a lot of baby Susans around these days. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you. I am just honored to um, be in your presence, truly. Um, I uh, was thinking as Susan was talking about the journey of my own family. My mom had Alzheimer's disease for 10 years and my father had Parkinson's as well. And my sister and I navigated that course with them for about 10 years and everything that Susan said just so resonated with me. Uh, and I thank you for your wisdom and your, your persistence in keeping that message alive for all of us. So um, in the, the next little while, I'd like to, to talk about the, to the topic of maintaining dignity and a sense of identity while also being a caregiver, which I think is, is one of those challenging things. I also want to just acknowledge that I know not everyone identifies with the word caregiver. Um, I think my, my colleague Tony in the back there talks about care partners, which I think is, is a, a lovely, lovely description. Um, but for the ease of simplicity today, we're going to use the word caregiver, uh, understanding that we, we may resonate in different ways with that particular word. I love this quote. They number in the thousands. They move with matter-of-fact purpose. Occasionally they rage. Sometimes with guilt. Almost always with love. Rarely with recognition. They are the caregivers. Spouses, parents, children, close relatives, and friends who have the responsibility of caring for a loved one. And per Rosalind Carter, there are four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers. Those who are currently caregivers those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. That kind of sums it up, doesn't it? <laughs> I think that's pretty much all of us. And, and Susan, I was really disappointed to hear you say that, that 60 is not the new, for, or 40 is not the new 60. Which one was it? <laughs> 60 is not the new 40. That really disappoints me. <laughs> <clears throat> So, you know, to define the term, um, a caregiver refers to anyone who provides assistance to someone else who is, in, to some degree, incapacitated or needs help. And informal family caregiver and family caregivers are terms that refer to unpaid individuals, such as family members or friends and neighbors who provide care. And due to the increased longevity and improvements in health of our populations, it's far more common for older individuals to be a caregiver. Um, my dad took care of my mom with advanced Alzheimer's as long as he could until he was 88, and then we had to make other, other arrangements for them um, because, because their care needs were different and they kept changing. Um, but again, not uncommon for caregivers themselves to be aging. Huge magnitude. There, it's estimated that there are 52 million informal and family caregivers who provide care to someone age 20 or above who's ill or disabled in the United States. Uh, and it, it, with uh, an estimate of 8.9 million caregivers uh, caring for someone 50 years of age or older who has dementia. Generally speaking, most caregivers are women, although the research suggests that that is changing and more and more men are becoming caregivers as well. Uh, we also know that it's risky, and that's why you're here today. We want you to take care of yourselves as much as is possible while being a caregiver. Uh, some studies have found that female caregivers are more likely than males to suffer from anxiety and depression and other symptoms associated with stress. Uh, we also know that there may be physical changes for caregivers, may have an increased blood pressure and insulin levels, impaired immune systems, and be at risk for cardiovascular disease and other adverse health outcomes. And then we also know that older spousal caregivers between the ages of 66 and 96 who experience caregiving-related stress 
have a 63% higher mortality rate than non-caregivers of the same age. If that statistic doesn't stop us in our tracks, I don't know what does. So take a deep breath, <laughs> check in with yourself, see how you're doing. Um, and we also know that psychological health appears to be the aspect most highly affected by caregiving. Higher levels of depressive symptoms and mental health problems among caregivers are reported compared to non-caregiving peers. And depression is the most common psychological disorder with 20 to 50% of caregivers reporting symptoms. That's a pretty broad range. And, and it's, not, it's not static, it's, it's dynamic. There may be times when you feel filled with just um, missionary-like zeal in caregiving. And then there may be other times when you feel like, I can't bear to do this one more moment. Uh, and it continues to change. And I'm seeing some nods, so that I, I'm hoping that that resonates for some of you. Some of the fears that the, the families I work with talk about among caregivers are the future. I can handle this today, but what's this going to look like tomorrow? Um, the progression of the illness and what that might look like. Fear of their loved one dying. And sometimes, though not spoken easily, fear that death will never come. You know, I was visiting some friends in the Bay Area over the weekend, and um, my friend's uh, a very elderly mom has multiple chronic illnesses and landed in the hospital this weekend. And, and she said to my friend, how long does this have to go on anyway at, at 93? I had a hospice patient a few years ago who is 103 years old, and she woke up every morning and asked the hospice team, why am I still here? <laughs> we certainly did not have a good answer for her. <clears throat> so, given that not very exciting data that I just shared with you, that sobering data, how does one grow into the caregiver role without entirely losing one's existing self-identity? How does one maintain dignity and hope? How does one not only survive, but even thrive at times in a caregiving role? And how does one nurture what in the mental health field we call protective factors and build resilience while caregiving? Susan used the word resilience, and, and it looks like you're going to have a, a day with that theme woven through, and I'm thrilled about that. Um, I will call your attention to uh, something that I love that's in your program, uh, is the quote by Tia Walker, caregiving often calls us to lean into love we didn't know possible. Absolutely beautiful quote. So how does one create this? Ask yourself who you were before all this Parkinson's stuff started to happen. Who are you now? And are there places where both intersect? Are there still parts of yourself that remain very intact despite assuming other new roles in caregiving? We, all, we know that caregiving is stressful. We just looked at that data. But some studies show that there are also some beneficial effects, including feeling positive about helping, feeling appreciated, and feeling that their recipient with the, uh, their relationship with the recipient of care, in some cases, has strengthened and improved. Uh, there may be places where uh, you found humor or, or a sense of resilience that you didn't know was possible in the relationship. Some of the things that we know really help are education. Events like today are really important. Knowing your resources. Um, certainly the Parkinson's Foundation has multiple, multiple resources that are so helpful. Counseling can be very, very helpful just in terms of a place to gain support and maintain perspective. And support groups like this one, as Susan mentioned, a big, giant support group all day long, which is wonderful. And then family caregiver trainings and classes can really reduce that sense of isolation and offer tools that can help you feel a sense of mastery over what you're doing. But we do know that caregiving is not only not a single event in time, but it can be overwhelming at times. And if one stays in a place of being overwhelmed for too long, it can certainly lead to caregiver burnout. Other questions to ask yourself, do I feel overwhelmed with the responsibilities and stresses of being a caregiver? I suspect the answer might be sometimes. Maybe not every day, but some days. Do I feel torn or conflicted between my roles of caregiver and that of spouse, parent, child, or friend? 
Because caregiving rarely happens in isolation. We may be also balancing other, other caregiving responsibilities. I know my sister at one point said to me, I'm so caught in the middle of my kids' needs, my grandkids' needs, and our parents' needs. You know, that classic sandwich generation that, that we've heard and talked about. Do I feel torn or conflicted between my roles of caregiver and, and again, that of spouse or parent? And, and do I feel that all of my energy is focused on everyone else? You know, I, I know some of the, the people that I work with, when I ask them what they're doing to take care of themselves, they sometimes look at me like I have two heads. Like, how on earth do I have time to take care of me when I'm doing everything else? And yet, I'd like to suggest that it's crucial. It's crucial to try to find ways to take care of yourself, despite taking care of many others in your life. Do I wonder what happened to me? Do I feel I have no time to take care of myself or do the things I enjoy? Am I feeling guilt for being angry, frustrated, and stressed? And do I feel alone in my situation? The longer an illness goes on, the greater risk there is for becoming isolated. And so it's really, really important to try to make sure that you stay connected uh, with others who understand the situation that you're in. Uh, the National Alliance for Caregiving shows these top four caregiver concerns. One is, of course, keeping your loved ones safe. That's a huge, huge and important issue. Also managing your own stress. Finding the activities to do with your loved ones, and that may change over the course of an illness. And then, of course, taking time for yourself. It's not easy. And again, I would suggest it's a dynamic process. Uh, something that I, I find myself talking with many of the families I work with about is that we make a plan for now, and then be prepared to change it as the situation changes. You know, and, that, and that's hard, especially for those of us who like to have some modicum of control, um, that we find ourselves challenged to let go again and again and again, um, and to adapt to, to what is coming or to adapt to what's before us today. I mentioned that the risk of anxiety and depression is pretty significant for caregivers, and so I think it's important to take an inventory and ask yourself if you're experiencing any of these things. Um, the symptoms of anxiety can include nervousness, tension, kind of a panicky sense, heart palpitations, you know, sweaty palms, confusion, fear, um, feeling that something bad's going to happen. Uh, f feelings of losing control, anger, or irritation, and the physical symptoms, again, heart palpitations, and um, maybe sometimes having a hard time catching your breath. Has anybody ever experienced anxiety before? <laughs> I did this weekend. I had a dream about this conference. <laughs> and I had a dream. Now, those of you who aren't from here may not know that getting across the bridge to Vancouver, you have to start about a week in advance. <laughs> And so I had a dream that not only had I not prepared for this talk, but that it was in Vancouver. <laughs> and I woke up in the morning and quickly grabbed the, the information that Vaughn had sent to me to make sure I knew where this conference was today. <laughs> but sometimes anxiety shows up in our dreams. Sometimes it shows up you know, when we're sitting in traffic. Sometimes it shows up just because we're feeling stressed. So one of the most helpful things you can do with anxiety is to breathe, okay? Let's do that. Let's take a deep breath together, okay? Everybody? Okay. Let it out. And how about another one? Doesn't that feel different when we breathe well? When we're anxious, one of the things that happens is that we breathe very shallowly. We get a push of adrenaline, a push of cortisol, our heart rate goes up. And we often get into this loop of um, kind of ruminative thinking. And, and that takes its toll on our, our psychological well-being. It takes its toll on our bodies. We have to breathe anyway. So why not breathe well? <laughs> and, and so I think it's one of those things that, you know, it's the foundation of meditation practices, it's the foundation of relaxation techniques, is breathing. And just by breathing well, we often can quiet down our bodies and quiet down our minds. The other thing to remember is that when we're anxious and worried, 
Usually, our thinking goes circular, and we're either worried about the past or we're worried about my, what might come in, in the future. And so both of those things take us out of the present. And when we talk about being in the present moment, and I loved Susan's comment about a Methodist growth group. Um, we're not trying to be a Methodist growth group. We're just trying to take care of you. <laughs> and that is try to stay out of worry as much as you can. And one of the ways to do that is to focus on your breathing, come back to the moment, come back to the situation at hand, and try not to get too far ahead of yourself in your worries. Uh, that's not easy to do, but it, but it helps. One of the th other things you can do is identify your cause of anxiety. Talk with someone who's been through something similar. Like any number of, of your, your peers here um, may have some really good ideas having been through w what they've been through. Um, and also, again, using re relaxation techniques. Um, there are some really interesting apps that you can put on your phone these days that it's a 10-minute app on relaxation and mindfulness. And one of my colleagues, who's pretty high-strung and has a two-year-old, uh, decided she wanted to learn how to do this. And so she got this app on her phone, and she programmed it for 10 minutes, and she's breathing, and then she looks at it and goes, two minutes? What do you mean, two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> it takes practice. <laughs> it takes practice. It doesn't have to be hours and hours, but if you can teach yourself some mindfulness techniques to just quiet down what our meditation teacher calls monkey brain, quiet down those monkeys that are going in our brains, and practice it, you'll get better at it. And they encourage you to do it a couple times a day. Yes. Uh, it's just mindfulness app. <laughs> and, and so, again, it takes practice. You two might be saying, two minutes? I thought I was already a half an hour into this. But uh, as you get more accustomed to it, it will get easier. And then if all those spells, of course, counseling can come in handy. And I always feel like I'm very self-serving when I mention that. But I do think that counseling can offer safe places to sort out and talk about the things that you may not feel able to say out loud to your loved one. You know, things that you're afraid of or things that uh, you fear might hurt your loved one if you were to actually be as honest as you, you might be. So um, the other thing that I think is very, very important is to recognize depression. Depression is more than periodic feelings of sadness. Depression can include appetite and sleep changes, feelings of hopelessness and helplessness, difficulty concentrating, fatigue. Uh, alcohol abuse may be a sign of depression, especially if, if it is recent or has worsened. And if these feelings occur during most of the day on most days and last more than three weeks, really encourage you to reach out and get some additional help. Um, a combination of counseling and possibly medication can, can really be helpful. Depression is one of those insidious things that stops us in our tracks. And, and I think it's really important to catch it early enough to be able to really actively intervene. So I, I found this list from your Caring and Coping uh, handout from the foundation, which I thought was beautiful. Um, forgive yourself for not being perfect. How many of you give yourselves a hard time if you, if you feel like you've fallen down on the job somehow or not been the mo brought your best or most patient self to the caregiving role? Yeah, anybody? Yeah. Yeah, I think allowing yourselves to be human and forgiving yourselves for not being perfect is beautiful. And acknowledging that you have the right to feel off balance emotionally. What does that mean? I think what that means is, you know, a lot of times if we're in a caregiving situation, we don't give ourselves much of a break. You know, we think, well, gosh, he's the one who's sick. You know, he's the one who's sick. What do I have to be complaining about? You know, you have a lot to be complaining about. It's, it's not that complaining helps so much, but it, it's okay to acknowledge that this is hard. This is a hard journey. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of reconfiguring to figure out what's working and, per the next point, knowing what your limits may be. Again, building in breaks and making them a priority. Being kind to yourself. I think that's beautiful, beautiful. Forgiving yourself, being kind, and trying to figure out how to find joy in the relationship with your loved one. <clears throat> I think it's really important also, and I love that this was on this list, try to forgive your loved one for past hurts. 
You know, illness never happens in isolation. We bring our relationship histories to the table when then illness occurs. And some of those relationship histories have prepared us for something like this and given us the tools, and other times not so much. And so trying to be forgiving of yourself, but also forgiving of your loved one, can really help you stay the distance. And then, of course, um, I love the tool that was in, in your handbook about assessing, do you have supportive friends and family? What is your physical health? You know, when's the last time you had your own physical checkup? Um, leisure and play, spiritual life, and a sense of community. All of these are such important things to pay attention to. Uh, again, as I mentioned, it's not uncommon to become pretty isolated the longer the disease lasts. And so trying to find ways to reduce that isolation is really important. There's a program that we offer here in, in Oregon that is called Powerful Tools for Caregivers. It was a model that was developed at Stanford University, and it's a 10-week course uh, for caregivers that are providing care for people with a variety of, of illnesses, and it's, it's a really empowering course. Um, but what I really loved was the answer to the question, can we really do it all? And they say yes and no, depending on how you define it. How do you find, define all? So they also say that it, it requires four things to do any job well, including that of caregiving. And that is that recognizing you can't do everything by yourself. You know, I grew up in a, a Swedish immigrant family. What do you know about Swedes? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> the stereotypes are what? You work very, very, very hard. <laughs> and you're very stoic. And you rarely ask for help. And you don't show your vulnerability. And that's, those are things that I've had to battle my whole life um, as a social worker, trying not to work harder than my clients work at their issue, <laughs> as a caregiver with um, my family. Um, when I recently shattered my ankle on Mother's Day and suddenly had to accept help, um, all those things that, you know, you don't kind of think of yourself as needing. Um, but I think as strong as we are, as skilled as we are, as capable as we are, all of us need help sometimes. And I think that that's an, a hard thing to ask for, sometimes a hard thing to accept, but crucial for long-term survival in caregiving. Taking breaks, trying to take vacations when you can, and, and this last one, being realistic about what you can and can't do. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm not always the best at assessing what's possible. <laughs> Sometimes I think it's possible to do far more than really is possible in the course of a day. So just trying to assess that. Resilience is a term that in my field we use a lot. Resilience is something that some of us, most, most of us have a, a certain amount of innate resilience that we're born with. But most resilience is cultivated. Most resilience comes about as a result of experiencing hardship and getting to the other side of it. And that's a really important thing to know so that it's possible, even in the midst of caregiving, to develop new skills and a sense of resilience that helps you kind of become reinvigorated. Uh, it's defined as an ability to recover from or adjust to misfortune or change. And remarkably, most of us do. Um, and steps to resilience include self-reflection, so an ability to really think about who you are, what works for you, relationships, again, not doing this in isolation, and action. Resilience can be developed, and it's learned in response to being exposed to difficulty. That's kind of at the heart of uh, people in my field of practice um, really believe in, that despite difficulty, it's possible to grow, it's possible to learn new skills, and it's possible, yes indeed, to even thrive. Not every minute, not every day, uh, but over the course of time. So some of the things that we know help to cultivate resilience is to take time for yourself. And caregivers are usually the first ones to say, how do I do that? I don't have time. You know, I'm on the job 24-7. Um, but I think it's imperative that you create ways to do that. Whether it's to say yes to that neighbor who's offered to come and, and be with your loved one while you 
take the time to go get your hair cut or, or just go for a walk or something like that. But also problem solving. That's really at the heart of resilience. And then managing your self-care. That's what this whole day is about. And setting some goals. You know, when I work with uh, groups of cancer patients, for example, they often really want to incorporate new health practices. But unless you set goals and make some action plans, it often doesn't come to fruition. We have to be specific about what those goals are. Deciding what you can do, um, make your plan behavior specific, and determine your confidence level. And then write it down. Write it down. It keeps you, it keeps you accountable to yourself. Or if you have a partner uh, that you can keep each other accountable, for these action plans. That can be really helpful as well. We also know that problem solving is at, at, at the heart of being able to find solutions. So if you identify the problem, list ideas, and try to solve them, select one to try, assess the results, and then if that doesn't work, try a different alternative. Um, I think it's really important to not get too locked on to one one solution because it may not work. And so if, if the resources don't work, try another one. Or try to accept that maybe now's not the time to try to fix this particular problem. It may be down the road that that becomes more, more possible. But focusing on self-care really means looking at what we can do. It also means learning how to communicate effectively with others, um, and that, that means having some of the hard conversations sometimes. Um, it's not easy to have the conversation with your loved one about things that aren't going well. Um, so you may need to practice how to talk about it, um, take it in small pieces, uh, take it at one issue at a time, which is a really important one, and then practice listening. There's a technique that therapists use with couples, and you might want to try this at home. Uh, the technique is if you've got an issue that you're struggling with, let each person take time to describe their experience of the problem and any ideas they have for a solution. But here's the trick. The, the person who goes first gets to talk uninterrupted. Okay? And then you switch, and the other person will talk about the problem and identify some solutions. And what it does is, especially with issues that are kind of contentious, what it does is it slows things down and it allows us to be heard. Because let's say that Susan and I are struggling with something. She tells me what she's thinking. Uh, I have to reiterate back to her what I, she just said. And that's not usually what we do. If somebody's coming at us with something they don't like, we're usually busy pulling the pin out of the grenade and getting ready to hurl it, right? You know? and, but if you stop and really listen and then reiterate back what they said, it allows the other person to feel like they're heard. And then you switch and you do the same. And it's really, really helpful to then slow down the process. And it, it does two things. It, it slows down the process, it's more effective, and also, each other feels heard. Usually in, in relationships, it's less important that we be right. It's more important that we feel heard and understood. And so just, just try it. It just slows it down a little bit. Now, men and women often uh, communicate a little bit differently from one of another. Have any of you discovered that? <laughs> and and we, there's some interesting research that suggests we process things very differently in our brain. And, and so um, my husband, for example, who's a very patient, patient man, will sometimes say, could you give me the cliff note version of what you're talking about? <laughs> or, or highlight the bullet points, you know? <laughs> And so, so I think, you know, it's really important to figure out how to communicate in ways that will work. Some messages to live by. You deserve to take care of yourself. You do. And taking care of yourself will enhance your ability to take care of those you love. And sometimes we forget that. We think that taking care of ourselves is selfish or not possible because we're so consumed with taking care of our loved one. But the well will run dry if we don't take moments to take care of ourselves as well. I spent Labor Day weekend in Bainbridge Island with a friend of mine whose husband is living with Parkinson's. And he has had Parkinson's now for about 10 years. And Hillary was one of, was, I'm emphasizing, one of the most high-strung controlling people I've ever known in my life. <laughs> 
Hillary isn't anymore. <laughs> and and I, I said to her, I told her about this conference, and I, I asked if she would give me some wisdom that she thought would be helpful. And she said, well, I don't know if this will work for everybody, but here's what I learned. Trust your instincts, and don't let anybody talk you out of them. Okay? You know what's right for your loved one and for you. She also said, think with your gut and don't let the docs get in your head <laughs> by telling them not to trust your instincts. And I really like that one. She and her husband had been working with a physician who said, that, you know, this can't possibly be happening related to the medicines you're on. But the person with Parkinson's had, was a pharmacist, a brilliant man. He, he knew. And finally, they said, you know what? I think we need to see another doctor. And they did, and in fact, they were right. Um, and that's where that particular pearl came from. And this one, which was really hard for her to say out loud because I've known her since high school, she said, be flexible. And I said, oh, Hillary. <laughs> and she said, I had to learn to let go of all my need to control things. And then also, she said, don't necessarily go to somebody else's dream doctor. Find the one that's the right fit for you and your loved one. And she said, she always asks herself, what would John want? Do I know what that is? And she talks about, as all of you in this room know, you're your loved one's advocate and ears, and he or she may not always hear the same things that you do. Um, and to make sure that all of your legal affairs are in order. And she showed me, she has all of her documents on an app called Evernote, and it's accessed through the, her phone. So if she's traveling and something happens, she can pull up all the medical records and documents that she needs um, on, her, on the Evernote. So some of the tips I think that, that are important to recognize are rewarding yourselves, with breaks, watching out for signs of depression, and don't delay in getting professional help. And when people offer to help, accept it. That's not easy to do, but it can save your life. And educate yourself and others about your loved one's condition, which you're doing, and being open um, to technologies and ideas that promote your loved one's independence. There's some really cool things out there that can really help your loved one maintain some degree of independence. And then, again, trusting your instincts, taking care of your health, dream new dreams, seek support, and stand up for your rights as, as caregivers. So just in, in closing, before we have some questions and, and discussion, um, resilience principles also means connecting to your purpose and meaning in life. That's kind of the bedrock of resilience. And in using your own unique strengths, you may have a lot of creative ideas that really work well in your situation. And then maintaining perspective. Um, that's that's a, a, something that I think is really, really important, to come back to this present moment, trying to stay out of worries about the future, and, and try to generate positive feelings, holding on to a sense of humor, if at all possible. Parkinson's isn't funny, but there's a lot about life that's funny. And if you can find ways to share that humor with your loved ones and with one another, that can be incredibly helpful. Being realistically optimistic builds resilience and persevering by being open-minded and flexible. And as, as I've said several times, reaching out to others. Reframing negative thoughts. Are you in a negative loop? That's where seeing a counselor can be really helpful. And kind of we, we use a technique called cognitive behavioral therapy that can help kind of reframe some of the ways we're talking to ourselves or some of the negative thoughts and recognizing the barriers to taking care of ourselves. Can I change what's happening? If not, can I ignore it? Or can I change my perception of what's happening? All of those things can be helpful. So a sense of hope is knowing that your present moment has meaning. And despite the difficulty, it absolutely can. And then finally, from uh, Compassionate Friends, which is a wonderful national group that supports parents who have lost children, we need not walk alone. We reach out to each other with love and understanding and with hope. We come together from all walks of life, from many different circumstances. And I realized last night I left out a word, we need not walk alone. <laughs> Important. And I'd like to devote this to my dad. <laughs> Thank you.
If you have a question for Susan, please raise your hand, and Denise and I will run to you with the mic. And then, oh. It's not really a question, just a comment mm -hmm. that, um, for myself anyway, I find it important that I make my husband, who has Parkinson's, also responsible. Mm -hmm. uh, like, don't leave the house without your cell phone. I, you know, I got tired of, I needed to find out where he was, or I needed to call him, and I hear the phone ringing in the kitchen, and he's not in the kitchen, he's left the house already. Right. So just yeah. Yeah. making sure he's also responsible for himself. I always say, don't stress me out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, depending on the situation and where your loved one is in the disease, they can do that, and they should do that. Hold Absolutely. them responsible as well. Absolutely. That, I'm so happy you said that, because I think sometimes we can overhelp, and that isn't necessarily good for us or for our loved one. He used to prepare his morning medication standing up at the kitchen counter when he wasn't very stable, and things would fall on the floor. And I, I asked him many, many times, could you do this, please, sitting down at the kitchen table? Mm -hmm. He said, no, no, I, this is how I'm going to do it. And then one day, some pills fell on the floor and almost killed our dog. Oh, my. And that would have been hard to forgive. Oh, And my. that's when he got it. He got and now it. he does it yeah. sitting down. So yeah. they need to take responsibility. Thank you. I, my husband has had Parkinson's for 11 years, and everything you've said is right on the mark. Thank you for your presentation. You. I've Thank heard you. this you know, over and over again. I do think, though, there are two issues that people do not talk about that are very important. And I'm a Parkinson's junkie. I do a lot of <laughs> volunteer work with my local group, and I'm in support groups, and I, we go to counseling, and et cetera, et cetera. Number one is finan limited financial resources mm -hmm. create a particular roadblock for people that I haven't discovered a way to to address the uh, we have long-term care insurance which al allows me to have an aid in three days a week okay. and that's my salvation Wonderful. but almost everybody else in my support groups do, do not have those resources and I do not live in a community of wealthy individuals mm -hmm. so I think that's one issue that we really need to talk about and develop some coping some ways to address that directly other than just telling people take time for yourself because taking time to go out and get your hair cut yeah. is not should not be a perk yeah. that should be just something yeah. that you do yeah. You're right. and the second thing is that um, you need Parkinson's resources where you live. I am really tired of the medical profession telling me, come back 200 miles from your house and check with me because we're a center of excellence. Mm -hmm. I am not going to drive yeah. 200 miles at this point. Mm -hmm. I want exercise programs, education programs, information programs where I live because that, and, and I'm very fortunate because the Neuro Challenge Foundation for Parkinson's is in my area and that's what they do. And that's how you address isolation. Mm -hmm. Isolation, you resolve that because, well, this is how we resolved it. There are exercise programs for people with PD. My husband goes to them. After a while, we go to an education program. Then we go to something else. Then we go to a potluck supper. So now we've got friends. Now he's got friends that he likes to be around. Yeah. So he says, let's do this um, with this couple. So we go out to dinner, and nobody's embarrassed mm -hmm. n because everybody has Parkinson's, and mm -hmm. you know we know it. Yeah. So we actually have an active social life, but it's because we have activities where we live. Mm -hmm. And I think that trying to say you um, you can do all this from thirty thousand feet, you know, we can control this from Miami. Mm -hmm. You can't. You can't. Yeah. Thank you. Or not Thank you for that question. I have a question back here, but or that comment rather. Um, but also say, you know, we have a, a limited scope today, uh, a limited time allotment. But there are evaluation forms in your bags, and we want to hear exactly that information on what are what's the information, what are the resources that are missing, mm -hmm. um, so we can try and help fill those gaps. So it, uh, loud and clear on the the financial issues and kind of how to navigate mm -hmm. that. So thank you for that comment. I have one question here. I think we can take one more after that. Well, my question is, you've had some wonderful slides, presentations up here, and 
I started out writing and thought, no, I really want to hear what you have to say. Is there somewhere that you're going to have your slides available that we could actually use those for references to I'm, take I'm that? looking at the lovely woman behind you, Vaughn. Is that possible? Yes, as long as our speakers agree, we will have totally. those slides available. <laughs> All, for, yes, for everyone. With, with yeah. speaker permission, we will be able to share yeah. the slides. And we have all of your email addresses since you registered. So we'll be sending you um, more of those communications and information. And you absolutely have my permission. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One more? Yeah. OK, one more. And then one more? Yes. One more? Yeah, don't, yeah, don't bother about taking too many notes. We'll get those out to you. I think one more. Hi, I'd just like to comment on your, your comment about uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm. There's, a, there's a very good book, very simple and very old, called Feeling Good. Oh, it's yes. been around forever. Ever, ever. And it's yeah. very simply written, and mm. it works. It does. Thank you. And it's still out there. And they have yeah, workbooks also. It's still out also. there. Yeah. It's, it's called yeah. Feeling Good. Feeling Good. Yep. Great. And I have one more. Oh. Um, author. Uh, Beck? Is, no, is it Beck? I'm trying to remember the author. Burn. It's Burn. That's right. Thank you. It's Burn. Yeah. I have one comment on uh, financial. There, I was just reading in AARP about uh, the Area Network on Aging. They do have a program. It does take a while to get registered in there, but it's offered through Medicare or Medicaid. And um, it is a free program where you can get respite help. But it takes about six to, to nine months to actually get into the system and get, get registered. But it is a free program. Great. Thank you. OK, over there. All right. One more. Just very quickly, I'm a medical social worker. I work with people all the time who are trying to plan ahead. Someday, all of us may be in a nursing home, you know, if we're lucky or unlucky, however you look at it. But what I recommend is if you do not have the long-term care insurance, go ahead and see a Medicaid estate planning lawyer. They can tell you legally what you can do with your funds, how you can protect them, so if your loved one someday is in a nursing home, that you do not deplete everything that you have. Thank you. I hope your day today is wonderful. <laughs>